Oh, so the top here is cases, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the first wave, the dreaded first wave where we locked everything down, okay? And this is the consequence of locking everything down, right? The way we mm -hmm. do, okay? This is the second wave starting in November of 2020, like this. Look at the shape of that curve, mm -hmm. okay? Right? Then this is the third wave. Look at the shape of that curve in the early parts. You see my cursor? Yeah. 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 Okay. There. Now look at what we're doing. So it's a very similar it's trajectory. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Okay. The graphs below here are so these are hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. right? And if you look, hospitalizations to a large extent follow what's here. There were more hospitalizations in the second wave than there was in the third wave, right? But hospital, the trend here is following exactly hospitalizations. ICU admissions are down. So that tells you that the vaccine works, right? But we're on the way. If you look at this, there's you can see this curve goes up and then it starts to flatten off before it actually hits the peak, right? There's mm -hmm. no way this curve is flattening out, right? So we're exactly where we are. And we can anticipate that it's going to do this probably. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you know, the virus is pretty predictable. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's our response that isn't very predictable, right? And so one of the reasons to test people is so that the statistics are accurate. And so that's another reason to go and get tested, right? So one is to know, do you have COVID or not? That's a reason. Second one is, um, is should you stay home? And that doesn't matter the value of the test. And then the other one is it doesn't really help you, but the province at least knows that you have tested, uh, mm -hmm. you've tested positive, yeah. Yeah, and, and those statistics I'm sure have been very interesting uh, recently seeing the number of people who catch COVID who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Those are numbers that people are probably watching very closely. Right, absolutely. And so, you know, the, the point about that is to use rough numbers. We, we know that in the province, total population, about six out of 10 people have been vaccinated. And if you look at the number of people that have developed COVID-19, and we know that's an underestimate, but nine out of 10 people have not been vaccinated. So the majority of people have been vaccinated, but the vast majority of people that get infected have not been vaccinated. So that tells you that the vaccine is effective. Mm -hmm. Now, some people might catch COVID, they're sick, but they might be hesitant to go to hospital because they think they're double vaccinated, they'll be fine. Um, what would you tell them? I think that's an important point. And basically the advice I give is it doesn't matter whether it's COVID or not. If you're sick, you should go to the hospital. So if you're sick enough to go to the hospital, go. Don't not go because you say, well, it can't be COVID. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's COVID. If it's something else and you're sick enough to go to the hospital, go to the hospital. Uh, you know, that's the important message there. And so the result of the test is irrelevant when it comes to knowing whether you should go to the hospital or not. Mm -hmm. Now, some people throughout COVID, we, we know some people are fine once they catch the virus, uh, uh, they kind of brush it off, whereas others may need to go to hospital, go to ICU, uh, even when they're vaccinated. What, do, you, do, you, do we know anything? What's the factors that might cause someone to be more likely to go to the ICU? Yeah, so, so really there's, so, so um, what determines whether somebody goes to the ICU is how sick they are and what kind of support medical care they need. So that may seem obvious. And what the question that you're really asking is, why do some people have a more severe manifestation of the disease than others? And uh, so there's a number of factors that go into that. One of them is, you know, how much reserve or capacity do you as an individual have to deal with an illness? So for example, if you're elderly and you have heart disease and you have high blood pressure and you have diabetes, then your body is just not able to, to, to deal with a severe illness 
as it is if you're in, you know, younger in your 20s and you have none of those other diseases. So that's a factor that's involved. But then there, and, and obesity is among those. And those are kind of the major issues. There are other factors as well. And so, and they have to do with subtleties in terms of how well your immune system works and whether or not the immune system is directed in a way that deals with the virus or whether it produces an inflammatory response that you know impairs your ability to uh, the lungs to work and then you end up going to hospital so it's and a, a lot of that we still don't know very much about is why is it that one person develops a response that controls the infection and another person develops a response where it doesn't seem to control the infection it's a vigorous response and it, it makes them sick but they're not controlling it particularly well. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the pandemic, we heard a lot about if you're at higher risk of COVID, you should be taking extra precautions. Now, as we go into this fourth wave, even if someone is double vaccinated and they are still in that high risk category, should they also be looking at those same precautions we were taking last year? Absolutely, because you know, if you, if you think about that, the fact that you've received two doses of a vaccine has a variable effect on your immunity. And it's whether or not you are immune that really counts, not the fact that you've, you've received two, two doses. Receiving two doses is very important. I mean, you're, you're obviously not going to be immune if you don't have two doses. But if you're a person who doesn't develop a particularly effective immune response, even if you've had two doses, it won't be very effective. It'll be somewhat effective, but not completely. And so if you're a person who is under powerful drugs to suppress your immune system for any reason, um, autoimmune disease, cancer therapy, having had a transplant, then that immune response is going to be less effective. And it may actually be almost the same as if you hadn't received the vaccine at all. You should, of course, still receive the vaccine because it's better than nothing. But if your immune system, if your immune response is not particularly effective, then you should be taking precautions. So bottom line, the vaccine uh, is effective, but not 100%. Right. And I get this question a lot from patients. They, they ask me, well, you know, I, I take all these drugs to suppress my immune system. Is there any point in taking the vaccine because it's not going to work? And the answer is, you know, even if it doesn't work as well, please take the vaccine. And I tell patients that the only reason to delay taking the vaccine is if your immune system is more suppressed today than it's going to be in a month. So if your immune system is going to be better in a month's time, then wait, wait a month because you'll get a better vaccine response. But if it's going to be the same as a month as it is today, take the vaccine today. Mm -hmm. You might as well. Yeah. And continuing the masking, social distancing, hand washing, all of those things that we were doing this time last year. For, for exactly the reasons that you've said, Carla. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. Is there anything else when we're talking about uh, vaccines, their effectiveness uh, as we head into the fall that you would want people to, to hear today? Well, I, th I think it's, it's really important for people to know that though that, that, you know, if you have, if you've made a decision to not take the vaccine, you put yourself at risk, you put yourself at risk for developing COVID-19, you put yourself at risk for going to the hospital, you put yourself at risk for uh, going to the ICU, okay? and you put yourself at risk for severe outcomes. And that's really important to know. And you also put the people that are close to you at risk as well. And so it's a decision that people make, and I would encourage them to look at that risk very, very carefully because the consequences of that decision are very important. Um, and you know, if you look at People that are in the ICU right now, the most recent statistics is 90% of people in the ICU with COVID-19 have not been vaccinated. 
I mean, that's a staggering statistic when you think about it, right? Um, and, and so it's very important to get vaccinated. You know, we're starting to see new variants coming. There's now Delta Plus, which is present in Canada. Um, and I think that Delta Plus has um, a, a worrisome risk of perpetuating this current wave. This current wave is, you know, if you look at the, the slope that the wave is coming up, it's very similar to the second and third wave, very similar um, to what those waves are. And we're about halfway up the curve right now. And we may, if this new plus variant turns out to be of concern, then we're going to see the, the curve continue to climb. And that's mm -hmm. really unfortunate because it is so preventable. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I can get you to stop sharing your screen and I can ask you about just how to digest the news about the, the vaccine somewhat losing effectiveness over time, some, some effectiveness over time. Um, if, if you can comment on that at all, what people should, should be aware of for that? Right. So, you know, we've been, we've been worried about the longevity of the vaccine right from the start of COVID. So we know that immunity to coronaviruses, when you get infected, doesn't last very long. That's why you can get a cold every year with the seasonal types of, the, you know, the cold versions of coronaviruses. So it doesn't last very long. So we said right from the start, are the vaccines really going to be more effective than natural, natural immunity because you got infected? And the answer is they turned out to be more effective than natural immunity from infection. But, and they may be a little more effective in terms of longevity infection, but it's still short. It's still mm -hmm. short, just like natural immunity to a coronavirus is. And so it's kind of anticipated that that's going to be the case. And so it comes as no surprise that, you know, there are now papers emerging that eight or nine months after vaccination, people are becoming, the, the immunity is dropping. It hasn't dropped completely. I mean, it's just dropping off, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to start thinking about, you know, the periodic boosters. Mm -hmm. which we've been talking about since the start of the pandemic. It's just that now it's becoming crystal clear that, you know, while our hope was the vaccine would be forever, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not. And that's uh, similar to other vaccines we see as well. It seems right. like. Yeah. But, you know, some of them are pretty good. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, some vaccines last a very long time. Right. But all vaccines, as you say, can wane. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we look at vaccines for me measles, we look at, you know, tetanus, for example, the, the regimen is to get a tetanus shot every 10 years, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. these are guidelines, but, you know, so unlike tetanus that lasts 10 years, coronavirus vaccines are, you know, starting to wane at eight months and probably, you know, we'll, we'll see how it turns out, but they may last a year. 